All right, welcome to this next lecture. Today we're going to get into plate tectonics. And plate tectonics, this lecture, I mean, it's hard to, to understate it. We are talking about very, very large ideas. And not to make a pun, but we're talking about very, very large objects. Um, and so this, this could be a little bit confusing at first. So um, I don't want to make this video last too long. So feel free to pause and rewind um, to go over things again. And of course, like always, uh, send me an email if you have any questions or if you'd like to do a review session, um, just let me know. So let's get right into it. So think about the last heavy rainstorm that you went through. If you went outside shortly after, you probably come across something, some scene like this, right? You've got little freshly carved valleys caused by water that's running over the earth. Down from that, there's going to be a shallow pool where the fine sediment is collected. What you know now is that this is a very small scale example of the eroding power of running water. These small scale changes are mirrored by much more dramatic large scale changes. For example, when Mount St. Helens, which is a volcano in Washington State out west, erupted last time in 1980, the entire side of the mountain was blown away and many, many miles of forests were flattened. By the way, we got lucky that it erupted one way and not the other. If it erupted the other way, Seattle would have been gone. Luckily, it erupted the correct way and only one person died. Um, and he died because he lived up on the mountain and, and didn't leave for some reason. I can look that up. Large volcanoes, earthquakes, tsunamis, these things are going to continue to change the course of rivers and destroy villages and towns. And let's get into why these things happen. You might have previously thought, and I really don't blame you for this, that the majority of the surface of the earth is unchanging. Mountains appear to be as permanent as anything we could think of. But as you're going to see, mountains can actually wear away in a smaller amount of time than the Earth has been around. And even the layout of the continents is not as permanent as it might appear. So how long can a mountain last? Certainly longer than our lifetime, but is there a way that we could maybe guess or come up with an estimate? Sure, let's do that. Let's think of an impossible, doesn't exist, rectangular mountain. Okay, so we know what a rectangle is. Four sides, two are going to be the same, and two, the other two will be the same, right? A rectangle. And if I was to want to find the volume of that rectangle, I would do take its length measurement, multiply by its width, and multiply by its height. Okay, so my imaginary mountain is going to be two kilometers long, four kilometers wide, and four kilometers tall. If I do that math, four times four is 16 times two, 32 kilometers cubed, okay? So not, the math isn't too ridiculous yet. Let's assume that our mountain has four streams running down it. And those streams, like we just saw in the very first uh, couple slides, they remove sediment, and our streams are going to remove about one-tenth a cubic meter of sediment a day. Okay, before I get into the math, you might say, well, what is that arbitrary amount of sediment that's being taken out? That's kind of like just a handful of sediment. If you put your hand in running water and kept it there the entire day, maybe you get a handful of dirt and rocks that get removed. I think it's a pretty safe bet. So let's just say our arbitrary mountain has an arbitrary four streams that are multiplied by taking that 1.1 meter, uh, one tenth meter cubed per stream per day. You multiply that by 365 days in a year, and we are removing from our streams, by and by our streams, 146 meters cubed per year. Okay, about 150 cubic meters are removed per year. That's six dump trucks full of sediment. It's quite a lot considering we're only taking little small handfuls every single day, but it adds up. So if I take 3.2 times 10 to the 10, by the way, that's just 32 kilometers, and we've rounded it down and done exponents. If I take that 
divided by 150, uh, this is our rounded up cubic meters removed per year, it will take 213 million years to remove our mountain. But 213 million years is only 4.7% of the entire time that Earth has been around. Earth has been around for 4.5 to 4.6 billion years. That gives you an idea, by the way, of the difference between a million and a billion. Um, but that's something we might get into at a later date. But 213 million years is only 4, almost 5% of Earth's entire existence. So what does that mean? Well, Earth still has mountains, so is my math incorrect? Well, if the math we did has any truth to it, and I, I'll just tell you, spoiler alert, it does, then the Earth should be completely smooth by now, but it isn't. This must mean that mountains are continuously being formed somehow. And that's actually true. What you'll find is that the Appalachian Mountains out east are a few hundred million years old. Whereas if you go out west to the Rocky Mountains, we found that they're only about 60 million years old. And so what you see is that, yes, due to the enormous amount of time that Earth has been around, mountains have come and gone in that time span. So something to think about they might not have before. Here is what a slope in the peaks look like in young and older mountains. On the left here is the peak of the Rocky Mountains, very jagged, very sharp. On the right here, the Appalachian Mountains, very shallow and, and sloping, not very sharp, very rounded. And this is to do with the passage of time and the effects of erosion. So very interesting with our young mountain on the left, older mountains on the right. <sighs> Volcanoes and earthquakes are the evidence of Earth's inner forces. So a volcano, let's talk about some words. First of all, magma. Magma is the subsurface molten rock. Now, a volcano erupting happens when that magma breaks through the surface. It can be sudden and dramatic, or it can be the slow surface flow of molten rock lava. What's the difference between magma and lava? Magma is underground, lava is above ground. They're the same te technically, it's just the, the term that scientists use when it's above ground or below ground. Earthquakes, on the other hand, are when the uh, rock breaks along a fault, which is a more or less flat surface. It's kind of like if you were stretching an elastic band and it just snaps because there's all that pressure being built up. Well, what you'll see is that we have plates that rub along each other and there's a lot of pressure being built up and finally that pressure just snaps and all of that energy gets released in wave form which is an earthquake. The ground rises and falls just like the surface of the ocean if you've ever seen an earthquake. Um, I've been through a very very small earthquake hardly did any damage but the whole earth was moving and it was really weird. Of course we have something called the Richter scale which is a magnitude scale based on the energy release. I think the one that I went through was a one on the Richter scale. So that is a little bit of an introduction. Here's the anatomy of an earthquake. Um, here we have a fault, which is the fracture in the rocks that make up the Earth's crust. Here are the two plates sliding against each other. When that slide finally happens, this energy is released. The epicenter is the point at the surface directly above the focus, which is the hypocenter, or the point within the Earth where the earthquake rupture starts. The plates are these massive rocks that make up the outer layer of the Earth's surface and whose movements along the faults trigger the earthquakes. We're just This is just a very uh, simple intro before we get into it. And then, of course, like I said, that energy is released in seismic waves. And a lot of damage can happen uh, from earthquakes. I'm sure we're all aware of that. Okay, so take a look at this large map of the world. In your mind, take North and South America eastwards towards Eurasia and Africa. Have you ever noticed that these coastlines seem to go together? Well, Francis Bacon, in Engl who was an English statesman and a natural um, philosopher, he pointed this out way back in 1620 
though he really had no explanation for this observation, just kind of like us at this point. We, we observe it, but we don't know why. And it would take, and it wouldn't be until the beginning of the 20th century, so the 1900s, almost 300 years later, that anyone would take it seriously enough to wonder why. And that would be in 1912, where we have a German meteorologist named Alfred Wegener propose that the Earth's continents are actually in motion. His hypothesis was that the continents were once joined and were for some reason ripped apart. Now, most scientists ignored this because though he did bring some evidence like, well, there's similar rock formations in this area and across the ocean in the same area, there's similar rock formations and we find similar fossils. But unfortunately, that data was just too fragmented. And in fact, some of it was actually wrong. He had the right idea, but he didn't have the ability or the means to get data to support it. And most importantly, he could never come up with how his proposed explanation happened. How did the continents move? Okay, they moved, but how? Couldn't come up with that. So, beginning in 1960, we start to get geologists and oceanographers who had the means to obtain new evidence to support only one aspect of Wegener's claim, the idea that the continents are not fixed but are indeed moving. Scientists thought that the bottoms of the oceans before this were just flat plains that would kind of act as a collecting bin for the sediments that would erode off the continents. Instead, what they find is that there are steep walled canyons and huge lofty mountains. In fact, the longest mountain range on Earth is the Mid-Atlantic Ridge completely in the middle of the ocean. By the way, interesting side note. We know far less about the bottom of our oceans than we know about the surface of the moon. That's kind of scary to me in a lot of ways. Um, I love being in the ocean, but there's always that, that question of what's down there. Um, okay, so, so here we have um, a topographic map of the ocean floor. Topographic just means looking at elevations and stuff. And you can see within... Uh, the oceans are these long mountainous ranges as well as deep trenches. So very, very interesting because previously we had no idea about that. Here are these um, parallel magnetic reversal strips. Um, and, and this was the, a piece of evidence um, which, which led them to believe that the, uh, the, the land was moving apart. Now, what you would find is that uh, the Earth, let's just, let's just start here. The Earth has magnetic poles, of course, the North Pole and the South Pole. And really, for reasons that are not fully understood, this magnetic field has been found to change directions sporadically over time, where the North Pole becomes the South Pole and the South Pole becomes the North Pole. Very, very strange. If that happened today... It wouldn't be doomsday, but a lot of things would be thrown off. More than 300 instances of magnetic field reversals have been recorded in ancient rocks spanning about 200 million years. Now, how do they figure this out? Well, when lava flows out of the ground, it contains small crystals of natural iron oxides. Natural iron oxides are magnetic. Um, and with something's magnetic, they are detectable through magnetic field resonance. So basically, what, they, what you found is that once the rock cools and hardens, you can measure the rocks, and we can tell whether the Earth's magnetic field was oriented as it is today, where north is north and south is south, or if it was reversed. And what scientists observe is, a mag is these magnetic stripes on the ocean floor that points to the seafloor spreading over time, and they're parallel. So you can kind of see that, well, at this point it was north-south, then it was south and north, and north and south, and south and north. And this gives credence to the fact that our ocean floor is spreading. Okay. The next, uh, well, here's another example of how the, the ocean floor will be spreading. So, 
but beside before I get into the new support for the theory, I also want to point out one other example. Let's just go back and maybe it'll make sense. Let's see. New support for the theory comes from um, magnetic, uh, sorry, not magnetic data, but uh, using radioactive isotopes, scientists are able to measure how long ago the rocks erupted and then cooled. Rocks near the mid-Atlantic ridge and other similar features were found to be quite young. Now, I say quite young, and I mean a few million years old, but the rocks that are collected farther and farther away get older and older, maybe hundreds, tens and tens and hundreds of million years old. So those three pieces of evidence are why are the early evidence that the floor, the, the ocean floors and the, the continents are moving. Now, we have new support for the theory today where we actually can measure the motions of continents. And that comes, this big breakthrough is radio astronomy, where we're able to measure the arrival of radio waves. And you're able to do that. You send out a radio wave and, and measure how long it takes to get to its, its destination. You do this enough over several years, you accrue enough data, and this allows for accurate point distant measurements. And what we found is that North America and Europe are separating at five centimeters, which is about two inches per year. Two inches per year, moving the entirety of North America and Europe away from each other at two inches per year. Think about how much energy it takes to do that. We'll talk about where that energy comes in a bit. And it might not seem like a lot, but it, it's pretty impressive to me. Okay, let's get into the, the what and the how. Plate tectonics. Plate tectonics, this theory, it provides a picture of the world that explains many of the Earth's large-scale features and phenomena. The central idea of the theory is that Earth's surface is broken up into plates. A dozen large ones, and then there's numerous small ones. Each plate is a rigid, moving sheet of rock up to 60 miles thick, composed of the crust and a little bit of the upper mantle. And then there's oceanic plates in the ocean. They have an average of five to seven miles of thick um, thickness of this dense rock known as basalt sitting on top of the mantle rock. So no continent, but they have this basalt. Continental plates have an average of 22 miles of thickness of lower density rock like granite capping the basalt. Okay. The tectonic plate boundaries are not the same as those as the continents in the oceans. If you remember that map I showed you, it doesn't follow the continents and the oceans. It's got its own boundaries. About a quarter of the Earth's surface is covered by continent, and the rest is ocean, three-fourths of it. On timescales of millions of years, these plates shift about on the planet's surface, and they carry the continents with them. Continental motion, or that Wegener's idea of continental drift, is only one manifestation of, of plate motion. There's others. So here's just that example of how here's North America, right? Parts of North America. And it's on the North American plate, which does not follow, you know, the country's boundaries. Okay, so it's got its own. Um, it's got its own boundaries, all right? So that's just something to keep in mind. Okay, if nothing can happen without some force acting upon it, what force can possibly be strong enough to move not only the continents, but the plates in which they sit on. What we found is that this is a result of the forces generated by the mantle convections that are happening deep within Earth. Motions driven by our planet's internal heat energy. Now, where is this energy coming from? Because if you know, if you remember, energy cannot be created or destroyed, it can only be transferred. Well, there's two sources of energy that contribute to our Earth's internal heat. Some of it is still left over from the Great Bombardment when we had those big, large masses of rock being slammed into the Earth over and over again, and that gravitational potential energy was converted into the heat or kinetic energy. And then the second source comes from the decay of radioactive elements, which are fairly common throughout the core and mantle. What you get is that heated particles move towards cooler areas. But Earth is just way too large to have the heated particles move to the surface by conduction alone. By the way, conduction is the process of movement of heat through the atomic collisions. That can happen on places like the Moon and the Mars, but it's too large to happen on Earth. 
Instead, what you get are convection cells, and I'll show you a picture of this in just a second. You get convection cells in the mantle. Now, convection um, is basically like you see in a pot of water. Heated up rocks uh, rise to the surface, they cool, and they sink again. Just like in a kettle of water, except it happens over 200 million years for one cycle. Here's what that looks like. So it's kind of like, imagine you just put the kettle of earth on a burner and that heat starts to warm up the liquid. In this case, it's rock. Uh, in your kettle, it'll be water where you get heating up, cooling, sinking down. And that's called a convection cell. And instead of happening in milliseconds in your kettle of water, it's happening over 200 million years on Earth's surface. Now, if it gets super hot and it breaks through this little tiny, you know, very fragile um, top, it, the, uh, the top of the crust, that's when you get explosions and volcanic eruptions. But if not, it continues this convection cycle. Okay, let's look at plate boundaries. And there's three types. Divergent is where two plates are going the opposite way. They are diverging. And this is where you get a spreading zone of crustal formation. What happens here? Volcanoes, earthquakes. You get the sea floor spreading if it's in the sea. And you get this newly erupted molten material that cools and becomes new plate material. And so you just get new, um, new plate material being made. The next is the convergent. It's a place where two plates are converging or coming together. You can have a, a, a few different examples of convergent plates, and I'll t show you picture, pictures of those in just a second. But if you have one plate that goes under the other one, that's called a subduction zone. And when a subduction zone happens, you get your deep oceanic trenches forming. If two plates have continents on them and they converge, well, none of those continents are going to sink under the other. And so a mountain forms, it pushes it up. I'll show you a picture of that. And then the last is a transform boundary. When one plate scrapes past the other, no new material is being introduced. Now this is not a smooth, you know, rubbing. This is a hard, you know, try pushing something that's an immovable force against an, un, you know, <laughs> an immovable force is this unstoppable object. Um, this is going to create a lot of stress. And what happens is when that does move, it creates earthquakes. Um, the big one, the most uh, familiar one to us, at least in America, is the San Andreas Fault. Um, and remember, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this, but everyone says, oh, the big one's coming uh, out there that would totally, you know, just wipe off uh, California. Very possible. Uh, hasn't happened yet. There have been uh, extremely massive earthquakes in the past, uh, totally wiping out the city, causing tons of damage. Um, but luckily, so far, um, they've, they've been relatively small since then. And that's the San Andreas Fault, which is a transform plate boundary. Let's take a look at what these look like. Here is the divergent plate boundary. So the magma will rise up. This is being um, spread out, and you get new oceanic crust. Here is um, an example, which is Africa's Great Rift Valley is a divergent plate boundary. That's just an example of one. Then there's the ocean-to-ocean -ocean plate boundary, where one will be uh, have the subvergence uh, over under the other, and that is going to create the deep ocean trench. The next is a continental continental uh, convergence, and that that none of those are going to go under the other, and so you are going to get crashing and pushing up of the continents to form mountains. And then an ocean continental plate, well, the one without a continent sitting on it, will submerge, and you will create another deep ocean trench. Okay. And here is our transform plate boundary in a picture of the San Andreas Fault in California. It marks the Pacific plate and the North American plate rubbing against each other. Like I said, this is not a smooth interaction. A lot of pressure is being built up, and when it finally does move, big things happen, big earthquakes. Here's an interesting one. Here's a map of the United States. Interestingly enough, all of this rock, for the most part, is hundreds of millions of years old. Like I said, the Appalachian Mountains formed somewhere 450 to 300 million years ago. 
whereas the Rocky Mountains are only about 60 million years old. And what you find is that everything probably west of Wichita, Kansas, are made up of these large chunks of earth. And they're called terrains or terrains from the Pacific Ocean. And basically, they just got pushed into the United States, or North America, pushed into and added to the Western United States over time. And so they're like hundreds of kilometers long, but they do have uh, very like succinct and very noticeable ends. And then a new one starts, of course. But what this, what this study has shown us is that at some point, living in old landlocked Wichita, Kansas, if you could go back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of million years ago, you might have had oceanfront property. And so it's just interesting to think about uh, that being the case and the grand scale of movement of these tectonic plates. So I hope this one wasn't too uh, boring or too difficult. Um, please give it another watch, take some good notes, and let me know if there's any questions. And I will see you guys in the next video.